Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. I'm grateful for my time in Calvary Chapel because they gave me an unfeigned, really childlike, high view of the scriptures that has yeah. never left me. Now, over 40 years of studying, I know something about the doctrines around the inspiration of scripture, but I mean something different than that. Yeah. I mean somewhere deep in my guts, the Bible is authoritative, however a scholar might put that. And I got a lifelong passion for evangelism because it yeah. was happening all around me. Yeah. And in the right. vineyard, you know, I can't say how much I benefited from being next to, intimately next to the genius of John's leadership. Again, we all know John wasn't perfect, but he will go down in history as one of the key Christian leaders of the late 20th century. Yeah, that's right. And you just don't see that every day. And I got to be in the shadow of it. So those leadership instincts and the kingdom and the spirit and worship. So like when people ask me, you know, over the last 15 years, well, you know, well, what about being an Anglican? Well, I didn't ditch all that stuff to become an Anglican. Yeah. I actually became an Anglican because they recruited me because they wanted precisely that mm. in this new Anglican movement in America. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host Jay Pathak talks with Bishop Todd Hunter. Bishop Hunter is the founding bishop of the Diocese of Church for the Sake of Others in the Anglican Church in North America and the founder of the Center for Formation, Justice, and Peace. He is also a former national director for the Association of Vineyard Churches, past president of Alpha USA, and author of a number of books. Bishop Hunter also serves on the Board of Trustees for Vineyard USA. Let's listen in. Well, Todd, thanks for joining us on our podcast. Hey, man, great to see you. The first time I've ever seen you ensconced in your home office. <laughs> I know. I've got books behind me. My wife color-coded them. So... Uh. So I have no idea how to find any book that I want to find now. So you're going to have to start memorizing <laughs> book covers. <laughs> I have to memorize the colors, which is going terribly for what it's worth. Uh, I have no idea where anything is, but it looks cooler. And so, Todd, you've probably not heard all of these episodes. So all, all it really is a story. I get to ask you a bunch of questions. So let's start where all good stories start, which is where you were born and grew up. Yeah, so I'm a Santa Ana, California guy. So uh, if you've ever flown into Orange County Airport, that's about mm -hmm. five miles from where I grew up. I grew up about seven miles from Newport Beach, which was my whole orientation as a kid, you know. I used to think Phoenix was like back east, you know. <laughs> I, I, you know I thought, that's so good. I thought my whole orientation was Newport, Huntington, Corona Del Mar, you know, the, wow. the beach. Went to Santa Ana High School. Um the Jesus movement was busting out when I was like late middle school into high school. Wait, wait, heard, back up, back up. Yeah, so what, yeah, yeah. what were your folks doing in Santa Ana? Because that's like a pretty nice place to grow up. How? how yeah. what, what was your family background? My parents were both from the South Bay of Los Angeles. So that's like mm. Redondo Beach, Hawthorne. They worked yeah. in the aer aerospace industry back oh, in the day. Oh, okay. And then one of them got a job at like Lockheed Martin or something that was more towards Orange County. Okay. And so they actually moved to Garden Grove. And ah. te technically, I was born when they lived in Garden Grove, but then they very soon moved to Santa Ana. And if you're not from Southern California, those are neighboring cities. Garden yeah, they're all next to each Ana. other. Yeah, they're all yeah. they're all the same yeah. place if you're not yes, from there. Exactly. But, but, yeah. but, but, totally. But, but when you're there, and so yeah. were you then raised with church life church background like are you in a home that's like hey we're really putting jesus in the center of what we do no i wouldn't put it that way but i think my mom <laughs> had a genuine faith hmm. i would say is that a family we are more like culturally christian we grew up going right. to first first united methodist church in santa Ana. okay and my mom taught sunday school and was the head of sunday school and i have memories of like helping her set up on Sunday mornings. But I certainly didn't have any faith hmm. at all growing up. Interesting. So so church is in the atmosphere. You're yes. helping. Mm -hmm. But sort of life-giving, day-to-day faith, like not really. 
No, nah, it was sort of at best, you know, you had kind of friends at church and, but I don't remember any spiritual inquisitiveness on my part. Hmm. You know, I was sort of a typical teenager. I'm too young to be a hippie. I, I have older brothers and sisters who were f- like full on hippies. So I was around that whole sex, drugs and rock and roll thing from a very right. young age. And that was kind of my orientation. So I just didn't have a lot of curiosity other than beyond this sort of civil, cultural religion we had. Huh. Huh. And and so what was like, so you're not a hippie. Were you like a jock or were you like a... Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, okay. Total, so, total jock. <laughs> wanted to be a major league baseball player. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I went to college and played baseball. And, oh, okay. See, so yeah. yeah, see, it's funny how... I mean, no matter what, how old you are, there's just categories. There's like, yeah. <laughs> like there's just yeah. s- streams you move in, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Bo- both my older brothers were very mechanical and raced cars. And uh, my one brother was great at woodworking. I got none of that. <laughs> but if it involves a ball, if it involves hand-eye coordination, except for golf, I got to say that. <laughs> really? Golf, golf was the hardest thing for me to master. It, right. But anything else baseball, basketball, tennis, racquetball, but golf was a hard one. Well, it is. It's a torturous game. It, yes. It said the guy who loves the game. I uh-huh. maybe, maybe that says more about me. I like torturing myself. Yeah. So, so you're this jock, but then you're saying in middle school, high school, all the Jesus people movement starts happening. And how did that influence you? How did you see that as a kid? Yeah, I don't exaggerate to say that it felt like every Monday we'd go back to school and two or three of our friends had like fallen, you know, they'd come back from the wow. tent at Calvary Chapel or whatever saying, hey, I found Jesus. We're like, what? You're giving up sex, jugs and rock and roll to go to church? I mean, <laughs> it really just did. It was not compelling at all to me. <laughs> and I was watching it happen right in front of my That's, face. That is so that is the opposite common story. You know, usually it's like, <laughs> yeah. and then I saw this and I was like, wow, what's going on with those guys? And and you're like, no, you're like, this is weird. What is wrong yes. with you people? You're so oh, weird. I just did not get it at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So then, so then you graduate and you go to play baseball, which is cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where did you go to school? Cal Poly Pomona. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right there. Okay. So now mm-hmm. you're playing baseball. That's still in the atmosphere. There's stuff happening. Right. Oh, yeah. We, how did you start to get swept in? Well, uh, just because the the movie, The Jesus Revolution, just came out. For those who saw it, you may remember one of the final scenes in the movie is um, Pastor Chuck hands Greg Laurie the keys to a church, hmm. this little Baptist church in Riverside, California, that Chuck had bought and had given Greg to house the ministry that Greg had had going in Riverside for, I don't know, I'm guessing here, maybe a year or two or something. Well, that's the church that Debbie and I got converted in. And the story is one of the kids on the baseball team just kept bugging me to go to church with him to, you know, I didn't know Greg Laurie. I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't, I doubt that I knew there was a Calvary Chapel in Riverside. So we go to church with him one night and this is so stereotypical. We get to church and there's literally hundreds of young people waiting in line to get in church. I'm like, what is this? People waiting to get, it's like a rock concert and people waiting to get in. I'm like, that got my attention. Like, this is crazy. And the church was so full. All the pews were full. People would sit, Mm. people would sit with their backs against the end caps. And then they would open the side windows of the church and put chairs outside the church. Wow. And we go in and the place is just electric with young people. I don't remember who played, but like Parable or The Way or, you know, one of those old Jesus bands <laughs> play. And Greg gets up with his long blonde hair and gives this very simple message. Hmm. And, you know, we're, Debbie and I are packed in these pews and I couldn't tell if Debbie's my wife, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't tell if she was like raising her hand and she couldn't tell if I was raising my hand. I love this. So we didn't like, quote, go forward that night, but we went back to my apartment in West Covina where we were part-time living together and driving Mm. home, we just realized, wow, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. Now I'd never heard a sermon on sex or anything, but something awakened in me that (laughs) night. And I remember I went to baseball practice the next week and told my friend, 
hey, we got to go forward next week and make it right. I think we got saved, but we need to go forward. <laughs> so so we go to church the next Sunday, same thing. Who knows who's playing? Keith Green, Parable, The Way, Somebody, uh, Love Song, who knows? I can't remember. It's a long, long time ago. And we stand up. As soon as Greg gives the invitation, we literally mm. stand up right in front of him. I think we mm. shocked him. Mm. And uh, and and got saved the, the, the good old-fashioned way by going forward. Dude. So, okay. I, 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 we could spend way too much time here, but I do want to just ask this. So, when you think about those days and you think about, like, the days we're in now... <laughs> Yeah. Cuz you're still doing ministry now. What what was happening? Like when you think about all that, what was that compared to like what we're doing? It was it just a move of God? I mean, you just look back and go, I don't know, it was just miraculous. Or was it a combination of some social things going on? I mean, how how do you when you reflect on that, how do you like add that up? Yeah, you know, if you read the scholars of evangelicalism, and if you read missiologists, they will talk about people movements and things that were happening in culture and that sort of thing. And I don't dispute any of that. But right. mostly, Jay, I think I would want to say, I don't mean to like, like reduce this in in a bad way, but I think mostly it really was genuinely a movement of God. Yeah. And that, you know, these movements don't last forever. And Debbie and I came in on kind of the tail end of it, but it was still happening in the mid seventies mm. when mm. Debbie got, and I got in on it. Yes. I, I mean, we were like radically converted. I mean, yeah. I can't overstate it. Mm. Radically converted. Everything about me felt like it changed overnight. Now, not that I haven't had to pursue spiritual formation for 50 years and not right. that I haven't had besetting sins, but man, it felt like, we were radically, drastically changed in an instant. Hmm. You know, our worldview, our commitments, our sense of right or wrong, et cetera, hunger for the Bible. Like, I would have hmm. never thought to... Th but, Jay, I was so ignorant of the Bible, somebody had to point out that the big numbers on the page, that corresponds to chapters. <laughs> and, right. and, the, and the little right. teeny numbers you can barely see, those are verses. Wow. So when you see Romans dot Romans twelve dot one and two, somebody had to show me this is how you look yeah, things up here's in the how Bible. That, here's what that means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And th I mean that's what they were starting with back then with most of us kids. But there was a genuine hunger hmm. as I would think of it now for worship, for immersing yourself in like the narrative and vibe hmm. and worldview of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Seems stunning. That's so great. I've, well, and yeah, it makes me want to ask a ton of questions, but but you have this radical conversion. Before that, you think you're going to school to do what? Well, I wanted to be a major league baseball player. I laugh now. <laughs> right. I laugh now in hindsight because anybody who's played elite sports knows that that last little gap is actually a really big gap. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, <laughs> like, yes. like statistically, I did better than 99% of kids doing baseball, but that last 1%, yeah, that's like a whole category of itself. So I yep. kind of laugh now. I don't think I ever really had a chance, but when I was 17, 18, 19, I, I thought I had a chance. I wanted to have a chance. Sure. But I really didn't. But, you know, to play baseball, you have to go to school and you have to, you know, you have to attend class and get grades. Right. So I studied business. So I have a degree in business from Cal Poly mm. Pomona. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you're like, you're kind of like, I guess I'm doing this degree, but I'm, I'm obviously yeah. going to be a I baseball player. I just didn't player. know what else to do. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but now you've encountered Jesus. Mm -hmm. and you're hungry and you're doing all the things but where where does that take you because now you're in this little church which obviously you bump into the vineyard somehow yeah so start to track out obviously your career mind starts to change yeah. how do those things when, when was the first time you were like i think i might be called by god to do yeah. this work was it pretty quick or did it so I was minute. converted when I was 19, so that probably means I was a sophomore. So mm -hmm. January of my sophomore year, that would mean we were going into spring baseball. Right. And I think that's the year that we actually won an NCAA Division II championship. Wow. And I didn't make the varsity team. They redshirted me. Oof. 
Yeah. And so, so they made me a redshirt freshman so I could have three more years because they didn't want me sitting on the bench in that like championship team if I could you right. know, save, save a year. So it's in that year that I start feeling something in my soul changing. Hmm. I don't feel the competitiveness I used to feel. Yeah. I think the penny's beginning to drop. And at some point in that year, like I could literally walk you to the exact place on the field where the coach is a very famous baseball coach in the time, John Scalina, s- uh, stopped me and said, hey, Hunter, the scouts just told me you're not going to make it. So I was 19 and wow. change. I could take you to the exact spot. And mm. I said, why, coach? And he got out his stopwatch and just went, like, you're too slow. Yeah. He said, you know, had you played in the 40s, maybe, because I was a great hitter, but I was one-dimensional. I could hit. That was about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, av- less than average speed, average arm. You don't make the major leagues with less yep. than average speed. <laughs> you, know, you just, you don't make it. And so, I, but something was already changing in my heart. And I think those were my first moments where I had this sense, destiny sounds like too big of a word, but if my 12 to 19 year old sense of destiny, you know, mm. playing for the Yankees or the Angels or something was shifting, I think now when I look back, there was a different sort of, I would now call it calling or vocation or destiny or something that was coming up. So by the time I graduated from college, and kind of didn't know what to do with myself, I told this guy, he, my coach happened to be a Greek Orthodox, sincere Christian. Hmm. And he said, you know, you ought to just take your time and figure this out. So that's when I went to Calvary Chapel Bible School up in Twin Peaks in the mountains uh. to just take like a gap year and to do what training Calvary, ha- Calvary Chapel happened and not had in 1978 for being trained for the ministry. So I did that, but not knowing really exactly what that meant. Hmm. So, and this is somewhat academic, but it's interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So Calvary Chapel was growing rapidly through this kind yes. of move of God. Mm-hmm. And they decide we're going to build a Bible college mm-hmm. with, I mean, it's just, inst- it's interesting to me to see how institutions just create themselves. So they, they, they yeah, decide yeah, right. with, all, with all these, you know, hippies coming to Christ, all these people, mm-hmm. We're going to now get a property and just start training in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. They literally bought a retreat center. I I don't remember who they bought it from, but it was a retreat center. Hmm. And, you know, in hindsight, Jay, you're right. I think the things that institutionalized the Jesus movement, and this is not a criticism whatsoever, was the Bible schools and schools, the music, Mm -hmm. and radio stations. I mean, Chuck. (laughs) built wow. churches all over the country by buying radio stations. Just preaching. Or buying, right. Yes, or buying licenses and starting radio stations. So at the wow. time, again, it all just felt like one movement. Right. So that's what I mean. When I use the word institutional here, I mean it in its benign sense. But right. that's what really, in a sense, structured hmm. the movement is things like the Bible school, Maranatha music, the radio stations, that, yeah. that sort of thing. You're right. Yeah, because you... So you're only however old you are. You're not that old. 22, 23. So you're 22, 23, and I assume it costs money to go to this Yeah, thing. not much, but a little bit, yeah. Some money, like probably yeah. a lot to you. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. you know, yeah, you yeah. don't have much money when you're that old. Yeah. So totally. it's like scrape together some money. Mm-hmm. And would you live there or are you just yeah. traveling up and down? So you like no, live? We, we lived up there in the mountains, yeah. Wow. So you just for a, are like for a year, it was two semesters. That was your training for ministry huh. was two semesters. <laughs> and the head of the Bible school was John McClure's brother, Don. Wow. And Don had met Chuck, uh, sorry, Don had met John Wimber and really liked him. Huh. And and kind of liked the openness to the spirit. And this right. was when this was when Wimber was still the director of the Charles E. Fuller um Institute for Evangelism and Church Growth when he's working with Wagner at Fuller. Yep. And, you know, the early Wimber before he got famous was kind of known by leaders as like just a genius about church. Right. And so Don McClure said to me, you're not going to go out and plant a church. You don't know anything. <laughs> go meet, go meet this Wimber guy. And I'm like, what? No way. Jesus is coming tomorrow, maybe. And, <laughs> right. You know, I had this vision to go quote back East and, and, and start a church because what happened, Jay, is 
I, it, almost, I, almost like immediately after getting saved, I started doing what we used to call a home Bible study at Calvary mm-hmm. Chapel, Costa Mesa. And it just so happened that two or three people in this little Bible study were in some of these early Maranatha bands. Like I know with the bass player from The Way and somebody else was in this Bible study. Hmm. And these guys would go out on their tours and they'd come home saying, man, all the kids back East wish they had churches like Calvary Chapel. And I just thought one day, well, then why doesn't somebody go make some? I mean, that's how naive I was. <laughs> just why doesn't somebody go make some? Like, how hard can this be? I love it. So that was literally my calling to church planning as a 19, 20 year old. So I went and met Wimber, sat in his living room. We talked for a couple hours. And at the end of the meeting, he says to me, you know, I don't know. I'm just kind of learning about this stuff, but I think the Holy Spirit's telling me to ask you to come be an intern with me before you go plant this church. Hmm. Well, you know, this is John's house in Yorba Linda, and we drive back up the mountains, and I say to my friend Tim, who's with me, I'm not doing that. Mm. I don't got six more months. Jesus could be back by then and, you know, quote, kids back <laughs> east are, di- <laughs> are dying and going to hell. Right. I'm, like, right. I'm like, hell no, I'm not going to do another internship. <laughs> like, just give me a stool, a guitar, and a Bible, and I'm yeah. good to go. Yeah, let's because, go. I mean, that sounds obviously now really naive, if not stupid, or maybe even arrogant. But in the moment, that's what looked real. Yeah. You really did just need a stool and a Bible and a guitar and learn how to pray for the sick, you know, because we were all influenced by Lonnie and that sort of early Calvary Chapel kind of charismatic thing. And so it, I honestly, I think I was just childlike. Right. I just thought, well, that's all you really needed. Just Go do it. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And yeah, there's something really, really beautiful about that. Because part of the reason why you're that naive is because that's what happened to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you walked in a room and encountered the Holy Spirit. And there's something really (laughs) simple about thinking, well, that could just happen to other people. Yeah. If that's what happened to me, why not? Yeah. Why not? (laughs) But uh, when I'm listening to you talk about back east, you weren't from there, nor had you no. even really been there. So you're not like, you know, I was always going out to Wheeling or yeah, Virginia. Yeah, no, none, none whatsoever. <laughs> so we go up to Bible school, and and the Lord actually speaks to me like that night or the next day or something. It was one of the first times I feel like I probably ever really heard the voice of God. And he mm. said, no, you are going to go do that internship. Wow. So that would have been like fall of 70. I probably met John in fall of 78 and started the internship in early 79, spring of 79. So in those six months that I was with him, when I told him, uh, this is maybe too long of a story to tell, but my first instinct was what we call the mid-Atlantic part of America. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, et cetera. And as I prayed about it, we I started feeling like it started focusing on West Virginia. And as I prayed about that, I went to the library and got a bunch of books on West Virginia and figured out the five biggest cities and started fasting and praying. And we felt like the Lord said, go to Wheeling. Well, when I said that to John, it was one of the first times he looked at me like, you just have no idea what you're talking about. I said, what? He said, well, do you know anything about ethnic Catholics, like Polish Catholics or (laughs) Italian Catholics? And and to your point, Jay, not only had I never been to Wheeling, West Virginia, I'd never been outside of California. I'd never been really outside of Southern California. And even then, my whole orientation was towards the ocean. It wasn't east. So John was just incredulous. I can remember him saying to me, come on, Todd, go to Dallas, go to Phoenix. Like, what do you mean you're going to go to this little (laughs) dying Rust Belt city full of ethnic Catholics? I love, I love this so much. (laughs) I, well, okay, okay, wait, back up, because I do have one other random thing to ask. So he's at Fuller. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you think that, like, a place like Fuller made sense of Calvary's little Bible school? Like, like we're over here. We're professionals. We're doing this, like, for a living. Yeah, 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 yeah. We built institutions. These yahoos buy a retreat center in the mountains. 
yeah. and think they're going to train people for a year. And yet somehow Wimber's tangentially connected to that. Yeah. But he's still in this other institution that had to build inherent tension. Like that's like so odd. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have been an insider to Fuller in those days, but my, but my sense of it is there's always been Bible schools in the kind of holiness or Baptist, you know, world that have always stood alongside seminaries like Fuller or Asbury or Gordon Conwell or something like that. Right. And I think people just accepted them for what they were. They were very different animals. Right. What gives the question you're asking a wrinkle is there would have been a respect at Fuller for the dynamic, if nothing else. I mean, yeah. Chuck Smith was on the cover of Time magazine. Right. Totally. So you can think that at least the missiologists at Fuller were going, what the heck is this? Yeah, that's right. So there was a kind of a respect, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But academically, you know, I'm sure, you know, the professional theologians <laughs> yeah, at Fuller exactly. would have thought, you know, I don't know what this is. Those, I don't know what those guys are doing over there, but... but yeah, well, exactly, well, because we're throwing around Lad's book and... Yeah. But Lad's yeah, like, yeah. hey, I'm over here actually teaching <laughs> like, like like you're you're taking like one tenth of one tenth of this thing i'm yeah. doing <laughs> and, yeah. you're, you're, and you're thinking I, you're, I never heard this firsthand but i heard it secondhand from people like wimber and others that that uh, lad was not always happy with what we were doing with him <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how could he be yeah, yeah i mean like this is a real serious person who's yeah. like dedicating his life to teaching a theology of the new testament and but i guess he, you know for decades now the vineyard has gone you know back and forth and all around uh, about the kingdom right but that just shows you the power of one simple thought of yeah, inauguration totally. yeah i mean that's the thing that lad gave john that was so imaginative yeah is that the kingdom is here it's not just to come yes and if and if john only had that one idea yeah that would ex that would explain a huge part of who john and then the vineyard became totally okay okay so we're back to wheeling so then he's like you don't know anything about anything what are you doing you've never yeah. even left southern california exactly but then you're like i think this is god i'm gonna do this and he's like, okay. He did. He just he finally <laughs> just said, okay. And I can't remember the exact moment, but it was like he resigned himself. It right. was like he had so much, what am I trying to say? It's like he had, he had such a growing respect and wanting to hear from the Spirit yeah. and believing that we were, that I think when I told him, John, I've been fasting and praying and for months. I think and it's gone. Won't go, yeah. he won't, it won't go away. He, I think he just finally said, okay. <laughs> let's, you know, let's do it. So you take so you take your your Bible, your guitar, and your stool. Mm -hmm. And did anybody go with you? Yes. In in my case, I went with John's old roads. For all you keyboard players out there, his his Fender eighty eight suitcase roads. Wow. Because my buddy was the guitar player. I mean, I played a little guitar, but I was mostly a keyboard player. So yeah, I moved across country with my. A uh, good friend, Tim, who had been the, the guy at Cal Poly who led me to the Lord. And we drove across country in this little Honda Civic hatchback with nothing and no money. And like literally I had like 60 bucks in our pocket and um, rolled into Wheeling, West Virginia one night without honestly knowing a single person in town. Wait, so sight unseen, you didn't even do one trip to like no, check it out? heck no. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> that's too smart <laughs> you just you just literally roll into town literally roll into town find a hotel let's look around well, for somewhere no, his to live. car his car broke down on the on the way from southern california to wheeling so we didn't have the money for a hotel like we literally only had like 60 bucks left and his wife's sister had beaten us there by a week or so because she was enrolling in school and she'd met a girl at school so the only person we knew, you know, this is obviously way before cell phones. So we drop a dime in a, you know, a restaurant parking lot somewhere and call her. She said, well, let me ask my roommate. And her roommate's mom put us up. 
<laughs> okay. And, this is like so, great. And so we lived there for about two weeks till we found a place. And then our, uh, our wives came out and we got jobs and just what, what kind of started jobs? doing the stuff. Well, my friend was shredding lettuce for a, but what, what Tim was shredding lettuce for a company that made lettuce for McDonald's because I had a degree in business. I was, my first job was teaching at a, at a, like a, what do you call it? Like a, a trade school for, and I would oh. teach the business classes at a trade school. I worked selling pianos and organs at a mall, uh, organ store where I'd play Proud Mary out on the out on the concourse hour by hour to try to draw them in. You just <laughs> to draw try them to in. draw and draw them in and sell them those <laughs> organs that had all these stops on it. You know, like pop and blues and you know rock. And so it's, yeah, we we just did whatever we could to, to earn a living and until things you know got big enough. Because then you're just doing a small group bringing people. Yeah, this was back in the day when John would say, you know, well, you should, before you go public, you should get up to like six small groups. Right. So we were starting small groups and then we started bringing them together on Sunday nights. And actually in probably 1980, uh, John came out with Lonnie and did a meeting for us on a Sunday night. Wow. I, I think, I think they were back. He's doing something else. And he came and the guy who owned the music store I was working at started a Christian radio station Hmm. and he knew I was from Southern California and knew something about that music. So he actually hired me to be like the program director. And then I did a morning air shift. So I was a, I was a DJ for a bit there on this brand new Christian (laughs) radio station. And then I had my own, then I had my own Bible study show called Fool's Wisdom, named after a song by Malcolm and Alwyn back in the day. And so I did some radio and, um, you know, we just started drawing people together. And then the time came where we did have, you know, four or five, six home groups and started Sunday morning. That's so great. And was there like, uh, there had to be culture shock with wheeling. Oh yeah. I would walk around downtown wheeling with flip flops and shorts and like Hawaiian (laughs) shirts and people would stop me and go, where are you from? (laughs) Seriously. It's like I was from Mars or something. Exactly. I've been in wheeling. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, so I would, I would, I would say, well, if you've been in wheeling, you know, that little downtown, that's where there was Guerrero music. I don't know if it's there anymore, (laughs) but, um, that's the company I worked for. And, and I, then I would say, well, I'm from Southern California. Like that explains the flip flops and blah, blah, blah. And then people would go, what the hell did you leave there to come here for? (laughs) You know, like this God forsaken place. I don't know how many evangelistic conversations started with why the heck would you move here? Why would you do that? Yeah. Right. That's so perfect. Okay. So now you've built a church and, and that takes years. I assume that's not like you know, one year you suddenly have a church years of this. And then you're like, I guess we're moving on from here. Well, and you're technically a vineyard, right? It's a vineyard church. Oh yes. Well, it started out as a Calvary chapel. Hmm. And then I, I never remember when the quote split happened. It's like 82 or 83. And Mm -hmm. I always forget it. We we need Caleb. Caleb would know. Yeah. He would know in that time, you know, the split happens and I didn't quote leave Calvary chapel because I was mad at Calvary chapel. It's that John and I had become really uncommonly close. Um, Right. You know, he was not just a mentor coach, but kind of a father figure. And, and so I, I guess I quote chose the vineyard because I was just staying with John. You know, right. was, to me it was it was a relational decision. I've I've never been like mad at Calvary Chapel or anything like that. So then, so yes, we're in Wheeling for seven years in '86 when you really have the beginning, uh, of the the kind of the worldwide height of John. Mm-hmm. He asked me to come back and basically run the vineyard Anaheim for him while he was running around the world being famous. Right. Uh, and, and I mean that with all joy and charm. Right. Right. So basically I was the day-to-day pastor. John would preach when he was in town. If he wasn't in town, I would preach. And so I did that for five years until 91. Wow. And in that height, there's conferences, there's... Yeah. Oh yeah. So you're not as much getting on planes. So he's going no. everywhere you're yeah. just there in anaheim doing mm-hmm. running leading, the staff 
Yeah, small groups, the, this yeah, and that. Doing the weekend services, that kind of thing, yeah. Wow. Okay. So you're you're back in that and that's a pretty intense time. There's a lot going on in that window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I you know, I was young when I came back in 86. I I was either just turning 30 or 29 or 30 and running that big mega church. I was young. Yeah. Well, and SoCal has a ton of vineyards popping mm -hmm. up. People are planting and Yeah. There's power. I mean, a lot of those conferences you can find the tape sets of or oh, yeah. in that window yeah. so you're yeah you guys are like a conferencing movement not just a local church really i mean there's Correct. things happening what once a month at least at least like yeah it seemed like quite a bit i mean we had vineyard ministries international that really would help put on those conferences but of course there would be a lot of overlap between that staff and the church staff because yep. most of it ha happened in our building wow and so when you think back on those days do you think like, man, that was chaotic or is it more like it was just fun? I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. So I just was doing stuff. I mean, how, how when you think back on that, that had to be a ton of pressure, but maybe you just didn't realize that you were just like, I don't know. I'm just doing my staff meeting this week and then I'll get ready for my sermon. I mean, do you, what do you like? sometimes yeah. when you're in a thing, you're just like, I don't know. I'm just doing this. I mean, I think that was mostly the dynamic. It, I mean, it felt intuitive. You know, Sam Thompson was there at the time as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I didn't have elders around me who could help me. Right. But Sam was beginning on working on building what we were calling then AVC, the Association right. in your churches. Yeah. So the idea was John was doing the renewal. I was running the church. Sam was beginning AVC. And, and there's a sense in which we were a team, and obviously I was a very junior junior partner on that right. team, but ha but had a very big job, had a very big role mm. in running mm. the Vineyard Anaheim. You know what I have said, Jay, my whole life looking back is that I would die on the hill of Mother's Day 77 to the next 10 years, any day, any time. Mm. It was magic the sense of the numinous of God, the beautiful, simple worship that facilitated that numinous of God, mm. John's simple, simple synoptic storytelling, you know, from the synoptic gospels and hit those first magic moments of inviting us into doing the stuff and yeah. learning to wait on God and pray for the sick. It was magic. And I don't know anything like it. Now, I wasn't around ten of the turn of the century Pentecostalism. You know, I wasn't around some of that sort of stuff or even maybe like the Catholic and Lutheran renewals and stuff right. in the 70s. But of what I've seen in almost 50 years now of following Jesus, those first 10 years were magic. Late registration is now available for our 2023 National Conference, Making All Things New. This year's focus is on evangelism, church planning, and global missions. And we're having this gathering in beautiful Black Mountain, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. If you're not able to join us in person, register today for our free live stream of all of the main sessions. The link is available in the show notes. Sign up today and see you there. It's just amazing to think how often we're in things that we don't know we're in. Like, we don't yeah. know what's happening. We're just, I don't know. This is, I mean, even just your story of planting, like, yeah. I'm just going to drive out here and I've got a friend who shreds lettuce and I play an organ out, <laughs> outside here. And, you know, obviously this is just what we're doing. Like, yeah. whatever. Um yeah. And yet you can look back on it and anybody listening right now as we're talking is like, wow, what a amazing story. But it's not amazing when you're doing it. It's yeah, just what's happening. Right. You don't have any consciousness <laughs> yeah, of it yeah, exactly. being amazing. In fact, <laughs> years later, John told me the story of 
he was driving home from Twin Peaks in the mountains back to Yorba Linda. I don't know what he'd been doing up there. And now I can't remember. I think we might've been driving together. And he said to me, you know, Todd, it was really hard for me to let you go. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it was one of those moments where I was learning that that there is so much riches in the kingdoms. Now we're back to lad, you know, so Mm -hmm. much riches in the inaugurated kingdom that we can and are supposed to give away my best. Mm. And I, I knew in letting you go that I, I was giving away my best. Now, I say that now with all due humility. When I was 24 and he's telling me that story, I didn't know what the heck it meant. Right. I had no idea. I knew he was being nice. I knew he was right. saying something nice. Yeah. But what he was teaching me was, I could have tried to keep you on my staff. Right. And I probably could have. You know, oh, yeah. and he's and he's right. Had he tried to talk me into it, he very well might have been able to keep me. But he was just telling me this kingdom principle. Yeah. And that's what I mean. That stuff was so alive. Yeah. Now again, it what I don't mean to say when I say it was magic, I don't A, I don't mean to say it's perfect, and B, I don't mean to say that the decades following that are not worthy. They are. They're worthy right. in their own ways. I mean the kind of stuff that God has done in through the vineyard for decades now is amazing. Yeah, I just mean to say those generative years when these right. ideas were taking hold were really something obviously yeah. special. Oh, it's so, it's amazing. Okay, so now you're through up into the early 90s and you somehow transition towards planting more churches slash becoming the national director. So, yeah. so that is, well, those, those seven years that we were in Wheeling, we helped start a lot of churches. And mm-hmm. as we were saying off air, you know, helped adopt in, you know, people like um, Steve Nicholson and Rich Nathan and people yeah. like that. So a lot of the stuff that was happening in the mid-Atlantic, Midwest stuff, I was right in the middle of because I was kind of Wimber's guy in that yeah, area. nearby, right. Yeah, those guys all had their own relationships with John, right. of course, but I was kind of the, you know, the early vineyard mm-hmm. representative. So this is the part of the story where it it gets a little difficult, but I know you like to keep things real. So I'll I'll tell this part of the story where I'm really being self-critical. When things started happening in more the late 80s and Mm -hmm. early 90s, I could just see that there was something different. And I I use that word very carefully because I don't want to say wrong or bad. Right. But there was something different in my view for what was coming out of that era. Mm-hmm. And and I could just sort of feel in my guts that that something was morphing. And so I, I left the vineyard Anaheim um, to kind of, in a sense, go find myself again and went mm-hmm. to Virginia Beach in 1991 for mm-hmm. three years. Again, helped plant some churches there, finally went to seminary. And then I remember I'm graduating in 1994, Wimber had asked me to come back and be the national director. And like literally the day or two before I was going to move back, I get a call from Randy Clark, Mm -hmm. who's in Toronto. And Toronto had only been going, I think, a couple of weeks. And Randy starts telling me about it. So I go back to be national director right as Toronto's breaking out. Right as it goes. Wow. Yep. And, you know, just all that we went through to try to figure out you know, sort out everything, you know, with Toronto. Yeah. So again, I can see, I can see, I can see the good in God and in every phase of the vineyard. I I think I just have this sort of special fondness, I think, for that first decade, more than, more than I have big criticisms, uh, you know, I mean, if you get me in private and give me a, chai tea latte you know <laughs> I, you know i might be willing to talk more specifically about Christ. right 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 but, but mostly i can i can see the good i i i totally I, because i lived it i totally understand yeah. what happened and all the ups and downs and ins and outs so yeah but leadership dynamics just work this way yeah. you know in some ways would it be that we could all just enjoy the best of things without having to be in the middle of all the leadership yeah. realities? Yeah. Okay, like like in, in some ways, 
some of the very hardest things I've ever been involved in as a leader. People who weren't in the middle, but were tangential are like, those were this the best. Yeah. But my thinking about some of those experiences is I can see the thing they're describing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's colored by like the hard meeting with the person who was upset or the moral failure that nobody else engaged. But I Mm -hmm. was like, you know, all the way in, you know, (laughs) in on having to have awkward meetings with people that were impacted and Mm -hmm. so some of those dynamics are just how close are you to the center and in some ways when you lead in that way you're serving people you're you're doing work so other people aren't Mm -hmm. they're able i say this all the time in our church environments or anything we're doing the vineyard we do all this work so people just walk in and worship and listen to teaching and minister You know, we're we're in yeah. some back room, like counting communion cups and, mm-hmm. you know, making yeah. sure we have the right XLR cables, you know, yeah. like nobody, totally. no, yeah. nobody's doing any of that stuff. They don't, right. they don't even know anybody's doing that. It just mm-hmm. feels like this magical land that they step into and yeah. <laughs> things just happen. And yeah. so some of that dynamic is just called leading, right? Yeah. But then there are realities you're describing which is things are shifting and moving they're dynamic mm-hmm. yes big moments are happening that you're now responsible and, and for big big personalities big events like yeah. you were drawing attention to some of those conferences oh th- those were enormous not just the size of the crowds but they were enormous in the expectancy of what they were going to do that oh sort yeah of stuff oh so yeah. yeah there there was a lot of both excitement and tension. But what I've told in numerous people is, and I'm not saying this like just to be polite on a podcast, I, I really believe this. I'm grateful for my time in Calvary Chapel because they gave me an unfeigned, really childlike high view of the scriptures that has yeah. never left me. Yeah. Now, ever, over 40 years of studying, I, I know something about the doctrines around the inspiration of scripture, but I mean something different than that. Yeah. I mean, somewhere deep in my guts, the Bible is authoritative. Yes. However, a scholar might put that. Yes. And I got a lifelong passion for evangelism because it yeah. was happening all around me. Yeah. And in That's the right. vineyard, I, you know, I can't say how much I benefited from being next to, intimately next to the genius of John's leadership. Again, we all know John wasn't perfect, but he was, he he will go down in history as one of the key Christian leaders of the late 20th century. Yeah, that's right. And you just don't see that every day. And I got to be in the shadow of it. So those leadership instincts and the kingdom and the spirit and worship so like when people ask me, you know, over the last 15 years, well, you know, well, what about being an Anglican? Well, I didn't ditch all that stuff to become an Anglican. Yeah, I actually became an Anglican because they recruited me because they wanted precisely that hmm. in this new Anglican movement in America. Yeah, that's I a- mean, I, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but here was the sentence. This was the recruiting sentence hmm. that came from the Anglican mission in the Americas. Do you think you could help us figure out how to make vineyard-like Anglican churches on the West Coast? Wow. And I thought, well, yeah, I guess I could help you do that. I thought I was getting a consulting job. I had no idea I would ever become an Anglican, (laughs) much less an Anglican bishop. Nikki Gumbel, you know, who to be at our conference coming up, uh, said to me, Todd, I think you became bishop faster than anybody in the history of the church. (laughs) And I I don't think that's probably actually true. It's probably close. It's so great. Um, But but I tell that story to say, I thought the the Anglicans were asking me to bring my history into them. Mm. Because, you know, John's gone by this point. Yeah. Most of the Anglican bishops who started this new movement in America have Wimber stories to tell. Yeah, they do. And so they just wanted that vibe in this new movement. Yeah. And and so, I, again, I say that to say that when I became an Anglican, I didn't jettison everything I learned from the vineyard. I was just trying to... Here's, here's the other thing I always say, that if 
if everything we've learned from John and others about the kingdom is true, that the that the ruling and reigning of God, the expression of God's being is what's preeminent, mm. well, then that means denominations by def- definition are secondary. It doesn't mean they're yes. bad, it just right. means they're secondary. Yes. So to me, I was just being a kingdom person in a different setting. Yep. But I didn't like ditch my vineyard friends or, you know, yeah, we're all, and, we're all busy. We're all living different lives. But totally. I never, in my heart, ditched the vineyard or ditched my friends in the vineyard. No, and and you and I sort of rekindled a lot of this conversation when I when we were starting the reorg. Caleb and I were. Yeah, mm-hmm. we started some conversations because we wanted to go back and understand our story. Yeah, from more of an insider perspective, not just sort of what you would read in an article, but. What was happening in these movements? Mm-hmm. And it seemed as though there were a number of leaders that were essential to the story of the vineyard, early board members, yeah. key people leading and key positions in the vineyard that we were like, a lot of these folks just aren't around. I don't know what mm-hmm. happened. Some, there was some conversation, well, was there maybe a moral problem here or a relational mm-hmm. thing happened or... But nobody quite knew what happened, but something happened, yeah. you know, so there's those kinds of stories. But then there's another category of folks. It's like, no, they're they're still doing ministry. They love the Lord. They speak fondly of the vineyard. But they're, something happened. Mm-hmm. So that started some of our conversation. Yeah. And then, of course, when I got nominated and then ultimately accepted to be the national director, you were one of the first people I was chasing around saying, Help me think about this, Todd. Like you now yeah. lead at this level. You have you have all this history in the vineyard. You speak so positively of the vineyard as an Anglican bishop. And so you and I had, I don't even know how many long conversations offline, just saying, help me get these things. And what is it you would yeah. want to say to yourself? And what do you want to tell me? Like where... <laughs> Yeah. And what am I, what do you think I'm agreeing to? What, where do you think that I'm mm. lacking wisdom or that maybe it could be a, a call of God in my life? And in, and, and in all of those ways, which ultimately led to me saying, as I was not just nominated, but then appointed to say, Todd, I would love for you to be a trustee with your history, with your love for the movement the leadership that you've offered in the larger body of Christ, would you consider this? And so here you are now yeah, uh, helping us massively. You've been such a help to me and to our movement. Thank you, Jay. Well, you just are. And so what, what would you want to say about what you see happening? Like you, you're, you have mm-hmm. a position. I mean, if trustees aren't in the day to day, you're not like, you know, building a goal sheet for a staff person or something so you're you're more at a larger level you're you're saying no we're, we're going to be help create financial responsibility we'll make sure that we enter into mm-hmm. crisis or we're going to assist different team members i mean you have different roles but what are you noticing because you've been around this a long time what would you want to say about what you've learned in the intervening years since you were the national director kind of how you're seeing the vineyard now, or maybe even the larger body of Christ mm-hmm. as, as an Anglican. What, what are things that you're aware of you think that would be helpful for people to hear or understand? Yeah, when when it was clear that John's health wasn't well, it might have been when I was becoming national director. It might have been around when he died. I can't remember for sure, but those listeners who know me a little bit will know that I I'm kind of an enthusiastic amateur sociologist of religion, Mm -hmm. not a professional one, just an amateur. But I remember geeking out for six months or a year on people like Max Weber and Thomas O'Day and theories of institutionalization and all that, just because I wanted to shepherd well the inflection point that I was at. I knew I was at an inflection point. I knew the vineyard was. Whether John was alive or not, Mm. we were at an inflection point. His death, of course, just made it even more pronounced. And so if you know anything about that religious sociology, that religious movements go through points of inflection. And I think we're at that place now that you're leading us at a Mm. time where it's another one of those inflection points. And these are always hard because 
um, there's a part of it that's liminal, which means you know it's uh, you're 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 leaving one era, but you're not quite into the new era yet. It makes everybody a little nervous. Yeah, changes relationships, changes reporting relationships, changes all kinds of stuff. Change is required for growth, but it makes us human beings anxious to go mm. through these changes. So I I think I see that happening, but I think what we need to think about is how do we leverage this moment? Hmm. So maybe going back a couple of years to the process you just described and maybe going forward just for, to pick a number five years. How do we leverage these seven years for the sake of the next 200? Yeah. Like what's the vineyard like 200 years from now? Yeah. That's, that's a really big question and we yeah. can't actually wrap our mind around it but we can be present to this moment yeah, and be present to what the Holy Spirit might be asking us to do in this moment to persist, to position the church for the, for the generations to come. And the challenge, of course, Jay, as you know, is we have to do, we have to lead these changes with having continuity to what birth does. Yes. And again, not that sort of cheesy thing where, you know, we sometimes it can be sport in the vineyard to argue about what really is the vineyard and <laughs> what are what are our truest values right. and which era, you know, if you could paint, there's probably I mean, off the top of my head, there's probably four or five key eras in the vineyard, you know, which one was the most real. If we could I, I know we can't actually set those aside, but if we could if we could come to uh, an understanding of that which we're trying to be in continuity with, yeah. while simultaneously preparing yeah. for the generations to come. I think that's the moment that we're called to lead in right now. Yeah. Amen. Well, and again, this is where I find Anglicans really helpful. Um, you know, because yeah, talk about continuity. I'm now in a 500 year old church. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's finding its own things to shudder about. By the way, right? That's a, that's a podcast for another day. It, it is, but 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 it's interesting to see the favor a guy like Wimber had and the Vineyard mm -hmm. has had with Anglican friends. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. I mean, I was just talking with Nikki Gumble about this when I was with him. I think what I would want to say, and again, I'm an amateur in every way, and I'm learning and understanding these things, but what I would want to say is I watch the impact of the vineyard in Wimber's ministry specifically yeah. in the UK, is the Anglicans had have containers that are stable mm -hmm. enough yeah. to manage a lot of the intensity and the power, really, of mm -hmm. the ministry they were experiencing around winter. Yeah. yeah. So both things were there. And, and, and But the, the containers are still flexible enough to allow leaders to kind of try some different kinds of things. Yeah. And yeah, I know... I don't, sorry, and, go ahead, Jay. And I know when you're with your friends, and you know, when I'm mm -hmm. with my Anglican friends, all they see is what's frustrating to be an Anglican. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, that's a good thought. But do you realize how messed up this is? With the, the, yeah, the, the, right. yeah. Which is fine. That's that's all part of just being in a family. Like, we all mm -hmm. notice our own warts. Yeah. But it's fascinating to me see the kind of connectivity of vineyard folks with Anglicans. Mm -hmm. And how I think we're in an interesting moment where our Anglican friends are really helping us think about the kinds of questions you're asking. Like, what does it look like to create enough stability, the continuity mm -hmm. can hold. Yeah. That we're not just constantly whipping around, but we are a part of the historic church. And that those things give us strength and life. It's not just sort of flat, institutional, whatever. Yeah. But it creates wires that electricity runs through. It, it, it creates mm -hmm. containers that can hold the yeah. new wine, Th those kinds right. of things. But. Yeah. I don't think I could have said yes to becoming an Anglican if it weren't for the story you're telling, Jay. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, I don't remember what year David Watson died, but I couldn't have been more than about 24 or 25. And he was right. a legend. Yeah. And then John Collins, who predated yep. um, Sandy Miller at HTB, yep. a legend. Then yeah. Sandy and David Pitches and uh, new wine and soul survivor and um, fresh expressions and the yep. alpha course and marriage course. I mean, I just think 
to me, I was joining a tribe that was English, evangelical, charismatic Anglicans, and mm -hmm. those kind of people like Graham Tomlin, Rick Thorpe, you know, my yeah. colleagues who are bishops now there, like, they just feel like that's my tribe. Yeah. Now, again, that's not the only tribe in the Worldwide Church of England, right. but I'm just saying that's been in my bones since my early 20s. Yeah, yeah. And I've had an affection for it. Oh, well, and the favor. I mean, when you hear yeah. the stories of Wimber showing up and mm -hmm. doing ministry in these churches, you know, I interviewed uh, Debbie Wright, and she's oh, describing yeah. Yeah. the meetings that they're watching. At her and, dad's church. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just, it's wild. Yeah. I mean, just, and, and, and even Wimber and Bob Fulton would say it was wilder than what we were experiencing in Anaheim. Mm. It was like yeah. some kind of favor. It was as though mm. these people had been praying and asking God mm. for a move like this. Yeah. And they roll in with a bus full of 20 somethings, mm -hmm. <laughs> like start walking around in some small church, you know. Yeah, laying and, hands on people. And it, it just kicks off, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody gets out of a wheelchair and a woman mm -hmm. who can't see can suddenly see. And, and Bob's accounting it is the funniest to me, you know, him seeing this person see, and he walks mm -hmm. outside and throws up. Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard that story in a long time. Because yeah. it, it was just it was so, so unnerving. Oh, so it was unnerving. just like, yeah. what is this? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. How, you know, it's the opposite of the, like, man of faith who, yeah. you know. Great man of God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. it's like, what is this? And and Wimber himself and, you know, the folks on the trip going, why is this happening? And, and in some ways, that's, a, again— it's a sovereign move of God. What are you, you going to say? Yeah. But yeah. there is something about people who are rooted in the scriptures that have been praying and asking God for yeah. these things to happen. And they have the kind of containers, they have the kind of wires that can manage that voltage um, yeah. because they have ways of behaving in the world. They have processes and oversight and bishops and yeah budgets and well, buildings and and, and and also that theological tradition represented by lewis stott and packer yes so you've got this really uh, like this firm net yeah uh that can hold you of that theology and then you've got this person and work of the spirit yeah. but it's not the the spirit's not moving around in something that's atheological precisely yep Totally grounded in Stott and Packer and Newbegin. Yes. Later, later Tom Wright. But you know, there's yep. this I, John Collins at HCB. I think was a well-known Bible teacher. Yeah. So it's rooted in this thing that felt very evangelical on the one hand. Yes. But charismatic on the other. Yeah. Well, and those friends are our friends. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're a vineyard pastor, you're you've probably read some Tom Wright. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm doing training. With our pastors and leaders, I'm working the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. Stott's yep. atonement Classic. frameworks. Yeah. Well, it's just yeah. it's just good. Yeah, and, it's a timeless, it's a timeless yeah, book. It's sure. just good. And the reason I'm working those that book is because that's what Rich Nathan worked with me. Mm -hmm. And it helped me see the yeah. frames. So the the sort of symbiotic nature of that is just been such an encouragement to me. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm so grateful you were willing to to step into this moment as we're moving through this these transitions. Uh, you are an interesting bridge, Todd. I mean, the things you've gotten to see, the things you've gotten to do, your yeah. affection for the vineyard. You've been in probably the messiest of the messy. So mm -hmm. it's not like you've had some mm -hmm. like, idyllic, yeah. distant view, you know. Yeah. And yet you still are like, hey, I, I, I believe in this. I believe in you guys. Yeah. I want I want the vineyard to flourish and to thrive. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, I'm I'm in. My kids are named after John and Carol. Yeah. That's those are my kids' names, John and Carol. You know, I'm still in Orange County two or three, four times a year, and wherever yeah. I am, I see Carol and yeah. you know, she's godmother to our daughter Carol, and we're all very close and love love her and Love that um, 
like I said, that era of my life, nothing has ever approached it. Um, yeah. In terms of like just seeing the goodness of God manifest routinely. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really grateful. I've taken a ton of your time. So hey, I, I, man, I should probably I'm cut you loose. But... Glad to do it. Good to be serving with you guys again. Yeah, I love it. I'm very, very grateful. We sent you a box of Vineyard USA swag. I swag, man. I was feeling cooler than I've ever... I've never been accused of being very cool. But when I got that box of swag, I don't know, I was feeling kind of cool for me. <laughs> well, you can just wear that to any of your Anglican meetings, you know, just... <laughs> Just a yeah. rep. No, I'll rep. bust it out. I'll bust it out for North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Great. Well, I really appreciate it, Todd. Thanks. Thanks again. All right. You're welcome. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org, and we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.